Yeah. Hey, welcome um, to Empowering Innovators and, uh, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, today we have uh, with us uh, Rob van den Heuvel, who is the CEO and co-founder of SendCloud, uh, one of the fastest growing scale-ups, I should say, by now in Europe in uh, e-commerce. Uh, Rob, uh, Sabi and Boss, who are the three co-founders, participated in the 2014 uh, Startup Bootcamp program in Amsterdam and have been having quite a ride ever since. And uh, I've asked Rob um, a few weeks ago if he would join me on this, uh, this conversation in order to share some of his experiences that he had in the last, uh, well, you started actually in 2012, so it's now over eight years awesome. in, in, in growing the company, um, what it has meant for him personally and his co-founders, uh, but also related to how do you scale a company and how do you scale, let's say, the team and the resources that you need to grow the company faster. Uh, Rob, welcome. Um, Maybe short introduction from yourself. Uh, where are you now based? Um, what is SendCloud like today? Maybe just a short one, two minute pitch from your side. Yeah. So I'm, uh, yeah, so Rob, I'm calling you from our office in, uh, in Eindhoven, actually, which are still our HQ. We also have an office in Munich. We have several people uh, working for us globally remote. Um, so SendCloud, basically, I had an online store at one point realized that shipping was a really yeah, shitty task. Many, uh, many, um, many th times I needed to manually enter order data. Our pricing was quite crappy. Um, returns were shitty. So basically the entire store is automated, but shipping was a problem. Then at one point we were thinking, hey, let's resolve this. And then let's try Google some kind of tool. Didn't find it. So then we started SendCloud. So SendCloud basically is an end-to-end an -end solution uh, for your online store's logistics. Right, so uh, we manage the entire software around your uh, logistics for an online store, which is, uh, e of course, an e-commerce play, which is, is a very good place to be in in, uh, in these in these weird uh, times. Currently, with 170 people, 27 people are joining us the second of June. So, just to give you a little bit of an insight in our in our growth. Um, what else? Yeah, currently active from seven countries, shipping globally. So uh, Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, France, Austria, Spain, Italy, entering the UK market later this year, and then the US. It's a super nutshell uh, intro. Yeah. Can you share something a little bit about the amount of revenue that goes over your platform currently a month and what you expect to be to going through the, the SendCloud platform uh, in 2020 and how that relates to 2019 yeah. without giving too much details maybe, but just a high level. Yeah, it's quite, it's more than, uh, if you, we usually talk about the amount of shipments, right? Going through yeah. our platform. Um, I think uh, in, the, in the last year we did around 40 million shipments and uh, we're looking at more than doubling it for this year. So it's gonna be 80 to 100 million shipments. Um, currently, I think we're per day, Processing around 250 to 300,000 shipments, so um, that's quite nice. <laughs> and ahead. that's quite an operation to run, right? Yeah, it's insane. It's um, it's quite it's quite heavy, especially like COVID caused us to jump 80% in one month, right? And that puts, of course, some huge pressure on your uh, operational team as well. Right. Even when they're working from remotely then full time, so uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, if we can go back to the, the early days, 2012, 2015, um, how has your, your role and that one of Sabi and Bas, your co-founders, uh, what, what was your role like in those days when you were a small team? And then later on, we're gonna go to, um, to what, what your role is today and how different that it is. But if we go back to 2013, 14, when you were just about to start and scaling up already a little bit, can you explain how your role was then? compared to how it is now? Yeah, so when we were just starting up, um, we were three friends, right? So um, I know Boss already for, for 15 years. I went to uh, high school with him and Sabi I know from T-Mobile, he did sales. Uh, it was my side job at the time. Um, yeah, so our jobs back then were just doing everything from support to sales to, except for development, right? So I managed the product a little bit, but I didn't do the development. So we had developers in-house already back then. Um, so it was really operational. So phoning customers, talking to them, helping them, setting it up, uh, connecting stores, all kinds of operational work. And I think slowly it evolved away from being 
totally away from the operation and managing teams. Um, first managing teams directly and then managing team leaders that manage the teams and then manage the team leaders of the team leaders. So that it, it changed a lot, but it's still, uh, it's still enjoyable. But it, it, what I see with many founders and I experienced this myself quite a few times and I think you're seeing this too, is that eventually as a founder, you're being squeezed maybe in a role yeah. that is very different from the reason that you actually started your company. When you were still extremely entrepreneurial, you were doing customer development, you were doing many things yourself. Yeah. Well, now you're basically, you know, can you still be the entrepreneur? Or are you leaning more, you know, are you spending 80% of your time on managing the team or are you still working on growing the business, looking at new innovations? How do you divide your time? And, and is that a struggle or not? Or Yeah, I think the, the struggle is time, manage, time management is always a struggle, right? So where do you dedicate your time? Um, but I, I still feel like a, like an entrepreneur, right? So I think I have a very good mid-management layer who takes away a lot of the managing. Um, and I'm still doing sometimes I'm a huge deal, right? I'm still operationally involved sometimes. I tend to be... The, the risk that I have is like when I hear something on the, on the, on, I say on the sales floor, I tend to jump in, right? And then you, it's very hard to jump out again. So um, I try to stay away from the, the operational work. Uh, but I still feel like an entrepreneur, not like a manager or something. I don't feel like that at all. No. But if you, if you go to that topic, right? I mean, I think many entrepreneurs feel this, that on one hand, you have to give the t team the responsibility to take things forward. On the other hand, you also have a, a meaning. Yeah? You, you, you have you know, a, an objective that you want to reach or you, you, know, you have a vision of where things go and they not always go in the direction where you want them to go. How do you deal with that balancing you know, maybe staying away a little bit from the business so you, you're not too much, you don't hear too much, uh, but you still want to hear in which direction that they're going. How are you dealing with that? Yeah, so with the top management, I have uh, it's very simple, a weekly meeting, which is very structured, right? So with everybody, I have the same kind of meeting. So I know, what's in, I know what the large projects are. I know what's, what they are involved with. So how do I deal with that? Yeah, to be honest, right, we just have like a, a, a yearly, we have like a... a a B hack, you can say, right? I think you yep. guys know it, big Harry and Dish goal. Um, and then we have three year goal, a one year goal, and quarterly goals. We basically build towards the B hack. And yep. I think the management team together is very, yeah, we are very synced in what we want to achieve. So I, I don't see that. I think part of my role is that everybody is running in the same direction yep. and that you don't get sales going left, marketing going right, and then fighting in the middle. Or, I, yeah, yep. I don't see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have a clear structure in place where you know, the three co-founders have divided you know, the tasks and the roles. You have your long-term vision and you're counting backwards per quarter in order to achieve those. Yeah, so, so very structured. And then, for example, even some departments are doing bi-weekly sprints working towards those quarterly goals, right? So to right. as small as possible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hey, I do remember a few years ago that we had some conversations when you were not only scaling up locally, but also internationally, and you were hiring people in France, you were hiring people in Germany. And, you know, I, I, I still remember that you were quite enthusiastic at the beginning of who you hired. And then a few months later, we talked and you said, well, it was actually not the right person. What well, can you explain some of the things that you learned in that process of hiring senior management and giving them the responsibility and maybe some mishires that we all have? Yeah. So of course we mishired a lot, um, but that's the way you learn. So Let's start with an example. I think um, Germany, we, we heard from everybody who went to Germany, right? You need a country manager who manages the country. And we are like, okay, yeah, who are we to judge this, right? Uh, so let's hire a country manager. Did that, hired a German um, with credentials, came from Rocket Internet, smart personal accounts. Um, two months later, yeah, it just didn't work out. But then again, it didn't work out because we hired him. We didn't support it. The product wasn't ready. So that's all, all the other stuff that, that comes with that. But then again, we hired another country manager for Germany and another one. And in the end, the result just was that the, there is no role country manager, right? So what does a country manager do? He should manage maybe sales, customer success, and marketing in a local office. And what you see is that that actually became a bottleneck towards the the people actually doing the sales, actually doing this customer success and the marketing. So a country manager was a non-existent role we were hiring for. It's also a failure on our end. And then we also hired the wrong people. 
Yeah, so, and that's just I have many of these. <laughs> yeah, no, but I think that's a great example. You 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 look at other companies how they're structured. Yeah. So you think, hey, we also need somebody locally on the ground that knows the culture, has the network. But then you found out from that this is actually a bottleneck in yeah. us growing. So how did you eventually resolve this? Are you doing this now centrally from the Netherlands, or are you? How are you organized now then from a so, sales perspective? Yeah, if you look at our uh, our sales perspective, we have um, all of our markets except for Germany are centralized. Um, Germany is decentralized in Munich. There are now thirty five, I think, people in Germany, maybe forty. Uh, in the meantime, so um, how do you resolve that? So we kind of cut out the the country manager, and we decided that, for example, if you're a, if you're leading a sales team, you're a head of sales, right? And then you also have, you can recruit for that. You have deep experience in sales. If you want a local head of marketing, you recruit a head of marketing who has deep experience in marketing. And head of marketing, head of sales, and head of customer success, they become like a localized management team. So that's how we run Germany, and the rest and we run report to to who? To you or to uh, they, they, they report to, for example, VP sales who reads our sales teams. They, okay. Yeah. 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 So he, and the VP customer success. Yeah. And they centralize everything. Yeah. So that's how it currently works. And all of our other markets we do from Eindhoven. Um, why did we do that? Because if there's if there's smaller markets, if you need to put in place every time a few heads, it becomes your organization becomes layered quite quickly. Yeah. Um, so we decided, hmm, let's not try and do that. So. If we start up a new market, we do it from 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 our head office. So we recruit right. natives, and uh, grow grow incubate markets from here, basically. And they relocate to the Netherlands, or do you find native speakers already that live in the Netherlands that are that are just have a French background or a Spanish background or both? I think in sixty uh, percent of the cases they relocate, so it's they relocate. and uh, yeah. they're already near. Yeah. Let's go to, that, um, to that, that hiring process because this is one of the topics that we dive a bit deeper in today. And uh, when we met, uh, I think it was six, seven months before, uh, before Corona, uh, you explained quite in depth your hiring principles and the process that yep. you have developed, which is quite extensive, I must say. That's written down, I think, in eight, nine pages, step by step. Um, can you explain, maybe starting with the hiring principles and the process that you use at SendCloud to um, bring new people on board, or at least starting from the recruitment point of view, because you're now hiring 20 to 30 people each month, I heard. Uh, so you need to have a process for that. Can you, can you explain where you started and when you found out, hey, we actually need a process for this if we're gonna hire at this scale? Yeah, I think even before that, right? Way before that, you need a strict hiring process. Um, look, it starts, I think, with the, uh, with the basic assumption that, look, the most important asset in your company are your people, your team. It's a total cliche, but it is actually true. And your front door is the hiring process, right? So yeah. why why are companies not being strict in the front door? Yeah. Uh, look, we had a lot of experience with mishires. So we we thought, hey, what is the most expensive thing that can happen is a mishire yeah. or not hiring anybody. But um, so to, just to resume, we um, have dedicated recruiters currently. We have three and fourth is starting uh, in, um, in, uh, in two, two, uh, the 2nd of June. So we have four recruiters uh, actively sourcing, right? So they're actually contacting people, but they also uh, guide the inbound. So let's say we get uh, five, 600, uh, I don't know how many applicants per month, something like that. They manage the entire process. So the recruiter is responsible for the hiring process. Recruiters are incentivized as well in our company. So they get paid a bonus when they source a candidate, which is, I think very good because in many startups, I can see people are hiring a recruiter and the recruiter just hires a recruiting agency to recruit pro. I think this is, this is so stupid, right? Why, why, would, why would you then hire a recruiter? But um, so that's where it starts out the front door. The recruiters are very strict on culture. So we have, uh, we have core values. And every, the first call, right, they kind of gauge on the cultural match. They gauge on a few other things as well. But I think culture is something that's very ingrained in our, uh, in our recruitment process. So let's say you, you are through the first step with a recruiter. Then you get the hiring manager, which is usually a head of marketing or a head of sales. They have a chat with you, culture, skill-wise. They test you in several ways. Um, after that, we do a full test day. So what does that mean? You get to one of our offices for a full day. We send you an assignment a few days before. Then we can also see if there are people come prepared or not or what they do. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and then they can really taste also the company culture, see who you're going to work with. We can see actively people interacting. And we have many interviews planned on that day as well. So it becomes like a pressure cooker. It's like the final selection days of Startup Bootcamp, uh, Patrick, a little bit. I understand so, uh, what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you get a lot, of, a lot of feedback, a lot of input, a lot of opinions. Yeah. Plus, if the people then in the end get hired, yeah. there's immediately a, like a broad, um, a broad uh, base for them, right? So yeah. if they already talk to the CTO and to the head of marketing and to, uh, what is it, uh, a recruiter, and everybody says thumbs up, yeah, yeah, they, these yeah. people have a yeah. broad base. That's in a super nutshell, the yeah. basic recruiting yeah. process. And if you talk about recruiters, does this mean that you have multiple recruiters in the company? Yeah. Yeah. How many, how many recruiters do you have? Uh, currently three or fourth are starting uh, in, a, in a few days. Yeah. And they're fixed on payroll. And on top of that, they get incentivized if, if the company hires, I guess, not just for the funnel. Yeah. Right? Or how does it work? No, they only get incentivized if they actually source somebody, right? So if it's inbound, they don't get incentivized. Right. Yeah, of okay. course, they, they, they want to fill their jobs, right? Because it's, I think we have 50 or 60 jobs open currently. So they're like, ah, oh, I'm so busy. Yeah. Um, but we, act, we explicitly made them source because that's where I think a lot of recruitment, recruitment departments go wrong. Um, so they only get paid if they do an outreach. Right. Okay. And, yeah. And that works well currently for you. Yeah. Works very well. I think that's the number one channel. The second important, most important channel of our highest is actually referrals. So it's people from SendCloud referring yeah. uh, other people. So we also incentivize that. So let's say um, you know somebody who can do sales. Yeah. There's also a bonus structure. So we have, we have a thousand euros gross if you refer somebody who gets hired. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Hey, one of the, the, the hiring principles and in the recruitment process is actually mentioned, uh, I read, is that you're, you're not looking for, let's say, the average Joe. Uh, you said you're looking for a good kind crazy. of crazy people. Yeah. What, what does this mean? A good kind of crazy person. Yeah, a good kind of crazy person has a strong own personality, right? He, can, he is maybe a little bit outgoing, likes, yeah, he's, he's just unique. We're looking for the weird ones, I think. The weird, nice, crazy ones. I think that's uh, that fits our culture really well. Uh, you know, Sabi, Patrick, I think that's exactly what I mean. <laughs> he fits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, well, I think you all three fit quite good to that. Uh, the good kind of crazy ones. Yeah. Yeah. And then the interviews that you that you have with the candidates, you also ask not very regular questions, right? Can you give some questions that you that you ask and and, and explain why you ask these questions? Yeah. What are you testing actually? So, there are there are several questions. Look. I, I ask different questions than, than, than Sabi for Sabi comes up with yeah. the greatest questions, but I mean, I, uh, what are the questions? I think we're mainly, we're not, they're not so weird anymore as they were in the past. Um, but we, the past used to ask you, what if you have unlimited money, what would you do just to see what some, what drives somebody? Um, we ask some weird, weird, tell a joke. <laughs> so that's just tell a joke, man. Huh? What? Yeah, that you get. Let's see if somebody just to see how they respond and if they're like, uh, yeah. yeah, if they're, they're snappy, yes, yes, yeah, on the, snappy, yeah. yes or no. Yeah. Um, what else? We we mainly also ask what are people's I think ambitions and what they want to achieve in life because I think having a job is should be aligned with your own ambitions a little bit. So let's say you're recruiting a sales agent and he wants to be a head of sales in the, in the coming one and a half years. That is a possibility. Yeah. So we really create growth brands as well. And I yeah. think that's, we're looking for people that are super smart. They want to grow, go to the next level. So there, there are many crazy questions, but yeah. we tend to ask the normal ones as well these days. What, what is the average age currently in SendCloud? 28, 28, something like that. Yeah. And what's the oldest person's age? 60 ish 60s and, yeah. and and still fits very well to the culture of yeah, yeah. and has that crazy attitude and yeah 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 she's less crazy but uh, she fits the culture really well <laughs> yeah yeah so hey, there's a few questions those... coming into the to the chat um yeah. one of them is how do you sync marketing sales product efforts in a specific country could it be harder if sales is one big department over all quarters oh uh, countries sorry yeah, Does so, that make sense? yeah, I think that actually, um, yeah, it makes sense, right? So how do you sync sales, marketing, support? Yeah. All, I think, to be honest, the easiest way 
to sync is actually having everybody at the same office. So in every market of SendCloud, the sales process is the same. And every, the marketing tools we used are the same because it's kind of centralized, right? So if you decentralize, right? That's for example, the German office, we used to have some, some struggles with that, but now yeah, pre COVID times, we just had people flying up and down. So management and, uh, and uh, also employees coming into the head office, us going to the German office, trying to keep that, that, that barrier, yeah, low, the, the contact very well. And, and, and I think one of the emphasis that you have is not only on the recruitment and the selection, but it's a very extensive onboarding process. Can you share a bit on how the onboarding works? Because I think it already works 90 days. It starts working 90 days before I actually start my new job, right? Can you explain a little bit how the warm up goes to the first day that I come to the office, how I'm being onboarded then? Yeah. Yeah, so we have, uh, we have a, this tool set in place, which we have, we have a fixed onboarding process for everybody. It's just company onboarding. Before that, we try to send you as much information as possible. We introduce you to your manager. Um, we have calls before that people actually onboard. So what to expect. Um, so we do, we do quite, quite a lot of stuff. And I think when, you have, when you're here on the first day, you get a nice welcome package. I think more, more companies do that, right? But I mean... You get a welcome package, your laptop, everything is pre-installed, everything works, your email works. Um, so it, don't figure that out on the first day, figure that out before. And then we have a structured company onboarding with product training. I give a, a strategy and vision um, presentation to everybody. So everybody who comes in knows where are we going? How does SoundCloud work? Um, yeah. And you bring right. people in then on the same day? So you, I guess you yeah. don't do this one-on-one, -on -one, but you do this with a new group of Higher, so you bring everybody in on the 2nd of June, Yeah, new batch. So, okay, you plan accordingly. Yeah, we try to plan in, in, in a group because that's nice for the people joining as well. Yeah. So what you yeah. don't want is starting alone. No, you start with a group. You yeah. start with the class of uh, June 2020 yeah. and there are 27 people. And uh, what you see is that they, we also um, organize a breakfast for them after they went, they also, we, they also go out, right? So we, we try to organize that they go out all together we have a meal with them so that's called the founders dinner so the yeah. three of us join and then we have just an informal formal dinner somewhere in the restaurant once they're open yeah uh, um yeah so we try to make it a really a nice nice experience as well yeah yeah can, can you suggest any tools that you use on the recruitment and on the onboarding side which which are the tools that you're like super happy with that help you you know, scale up on the recruitment and on the onboarding side. Yeah, so we use a, an ATS, it's called Greenhouse. Uh, it's an American company. Um, we used Workable before, but this is way better. So we kind of integrated the recruiting and onboarding part in one tool. It's called Greenhouse, works really well. LinkedIn, recruiter seats. If you want to source candidates, they're necessary, cost a shitload, but yeah, hey, LinkedIn needs to make money as well um what else do we use yeah a few other tools like we for example greenhouse places let's say we create a job it places them of course on 15 different job boards at once it really helps us to scale and to manage the pipeline and also to do rejections and all kinds of other stuff so greenhouse i would say is a recommendation yeah, yeah. and you also use scorecards i read yeah how does that work it's a feature of course so everybody who interviews also fills in a scorecard um and then you get to fill in a uh, definitely not no yes or strong yes um, if if it can can proceed and per job we interview on different yeah different different things so for example if you're a junior sales you have a different scorecard than a team lead for sales so junior sales we look at coachability motivation um, and all, all that kind of stuff and senior sales more or less experience uh, SaaS software service selling. Uh, does he know the market e-commerce so we, we look at different things per job yeah yeah and and the scorecards are part of the toolkit in yeah. greenhouse right okay yeah, so, that's, yeah. Yeah. so we i think every decent uh, applicant system right has scorecards yes, scorecards right uh, but not a whole lot of people use them uh, we didn't use them until we went over to greenhouse as well so we used to only fill in some comments right and then a yes or no yeah 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 good Hey, I'm looking at some of the questions that are coming in through the chat. Thanks for that, everybody. Um, is there a mistake that you keep on making while hiring? I hope not. I would be stupid. I mean, you can make, you, you always make mishires, right? So there are 27 people joining. I think it would be bad or weird if 
all of them succeed. So I think you should just be also strict in the first probation time and after the first contract, right? Um, offboarding is just as important as onboarding and recruiting. Um, is there a mistake? Yeah, yeah, mishires you keep on making, of course. Um, what percentage of, let's say you, you hire a, a new group of 30 people, what percentage is for you acceptable that doesn't make first three months, six months, shorter maybe uh, even? I'd say first three, I would say 5%. 5%. Yeah, so we really try to be strict at the front door. So I rather not, ha so we really, yeah, keep the front door closed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think 5% would be good. And I think if you look at, um, but it also depends, right? Is it company in do, do we? Um, say goodbye to somebody or yeah. do they yeah. leave themselves. So we also yeah. see sometimes that they, the job is not what they expected. Right. Or it's, it's too high pressure or uh, that they're like, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 some people leave as well, right? Yeah. I think yeah. it's within, I think 10%, I think it's more realistic. Yeah. Okay. And were there maybe mistakes in the past that you're not making anymore? If you, if you now go back, let's say three, four years, if you were thinking, how could I be thinking at that moment that this was, was there no process or what, what was it that you think was your biggest learning in hiring, which is crucial now for the company to grow further? Yeah, I would where I recommend everybody to do the test day. So one example is how I helped, we hired a German, a very experienced German again. Um, just from, uh, I flew into Berlin back then twice. I had a few drinks with him as well. So it was nice, right? Good chat, good vibe. First day he came at the office in the Netherlands for onboarding. I like, oh, shit, shit, what have I done? In a work environment was total mismatch. So I would say do a, do a real test day. Give those people an assignment. Get them in your office working. Just you see how they work. You see how they yeah. think. We've prevented so many, I would say, especially on the management level, so many wrong hires by actually getting them at the office. Yeah. Um, because especially in, in, for example, VP sales or something, right? If you're looking for, for high level manager and you, you don't do that, they can talk really well. They, they will easily blow through three interviews or four, but if you give them a test and an actual assignment that you get to see what they actually do. Can you give an example of an assignment that you would give to a salesperson? Because this is actually a question that we get from a lot of our startups and scale-ups. How do I find, how do I know? That, that salesperson will actually sell. And I always tell, you know, salespeople are very good at selling themselves. Many yeah. of them actually don't sell. So yeah. what kind of test do you do to, to at least get a, get a feeling if the person is actually capable in, in converting leads into a sales? Yeah. So that, again, depends on the level of a sales agent. But let's say you're looking for a junior. I, I'm not necessarily looking for a lot of experience. I'm looking for eagerness, coachability, uh, winner's mentality. So it's more of a set of characteristics. Yeah. And you give them an assignment like, hey, um, there's uh, 50 leads. How would you get the most out of these 50 leads? And how would you close some deals, right? And you, you, they get to talk to several, uh, oh, nice. They get to talk to several, uh, several sales agents currently working here, right? And they, you can see how, how quickly they pick up certain stuff. Right. Or if they give their own twist it. If you look for more experienced sales, yeah, that's, that's a tougher one. Yeah. Then I would... Uh, I would uh, maybe uh, depends, give them an assignment like, okay, so let's say you start here. This is your target. How are you going to reach your target in 90 days? So right. how are you going to structurally reach that? And then you get an assignment like, then you can see how they think. Yeah. Um, are they expecting inbound leads? Are they going to go outbound? Are they going to do cold calls? How are they going to do outreach? How is their process? Are they going to do a demo? Yeah. Um, yeah. And of course they get to talk to our current sales agents. Um, but from a senior, right, I expect some, some more. No, more strategic thinking, basically, yeah. on, on, on the process on how they will actually uh, acquire yeah. and bring on board new customers. Yeah, yeah. Hey, let's, let's move a bit to, uh, to, to personalities and, and profiles. Um, uh, when you joined Startup Bootcamp, uh, you made a Facet 5 uh, uh, test, which basically explains the personality of the founders. Uh, I know that recently you started talking to Michiel Kastelijns, who uh, basically owns the license of Facet 5 here in, uh, in the Netherlands and, and beyond. Yeah. Uh, at, at ASML, for example, everybody that is hired makes a Facet 5, which actually scores you on five domains. It's will and energy and affection and yeah. control and emotion. Um, do, do you also look at, let's say, the soft side and, and the personality side of the people that you bring on board? And how do you do this? Do you use a, a tool like Facet 5 or are you considering 
No, actually, facet, right? I think we're, imp we're going to implement it. I, I don't know yet if we're going to do it with everybody or with the leaders or senior, more senior people, but I mean, yeah. something we're considering. Um, so how do we, yeah, we, how do we really check the soft skills? I think it's in our scorecards anyway, right? Central yeah. culture, uh, the core values are in there. Is there a match? Yeah. Um, and by talking to, I think, in a test day, talking to many people, you get some kind of, you get a feeling anyway. I think it's very tough to, yeah, to, to put a number on it or, uh, yeah. So it's still like gut, yeah, I think a gut feeling thing, but then of many people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I, maybe I think something's interesting to add is I think really hiring here is a, is a real company effort, right? So everybody's participating in hiring. If you're a new junior, you're still participating in hiring other juniors as well, right? right, right. So yeah, that, yeah. And that's part of your culture to, to give everybody also that responsibility and, and yeah. also, you know, have them leverage their network, but also their brain capacity yeah. to bring new people on board and to, to check if they fit the culture. If yeah, you talk about culture, uh, you talked about your values. Can you explain what the values are of the company and how they match with the culture and how you nurse that? Yeah. So one of the values is, is no bullshit. It, it sounds Which hard. Means? It means the following, right? So we are open, we are transparent, we're honest. It's no bullshit. So no po politics in the office, right? So no backstabbing, just be open, be out there. It might be a little bit blunt sometimes, but rather that than the nasty backstabbing. Uh, so how, how do you deal with that when that still occurs? Because you can, you can say people, no backstabbing, no politics, yeah. but they might not even understand that they might be doing some backstabbing or some politics. How, how do yeah. you... Do you give yeah. examples of things that you don't accept or? Yeah, we do. But also like there, in, in some cases, somebody has a problem, right? And they run up to me and say, I have a problem with person X. First thing I say, did you talk to this person? Why are you coming to me? And then look, first thing is I always send them back, right? And then I, eight, nine out of 10 times it gets fixed uh, by not even touching it, just sending them back. But I mean, um, every just how we enforce this stuff right so it's kind of out there in our office anyway so it's it's on posters it's everywhere um we also review for it right so after you get hired yeah. uh, and onboarded where it's again pushed in inside your brain the review process right so employee development if you want to grow you need to adhere to the company values if you want to get a good performance basically you it's a component so we try to get it through the entire yeah hr cycle if you want to yeah. call it. yeah and how do you avoid that being subjective? That's tough. So um, it's something I think the, if you look at the leaders of the company, they should really adhere to it, be an example. Um, if the leaders of a company are going to go, yeah, in the, in the wrong direction against yeah. the values, it's, then you can forget it because yeah. then you basically make a new set because you're screwed. Yeah. No, um, I, I agree with what you're saying. Yeah. And we got a question from uh, Masood, which I know is based in New York. So he's still in quarantine, although he can go out now a little bit, I heard. Um, he, he asked, as you're growing so fast, where do you get your inspiration and uh, advisors from for your business as well as for your personal journey? Do investors play a role here or? Yeah. If you look at investors, they, I, I do have some, some investors which I contact right regularly. I think all of them, at least the main ones I have a monthly meeting with. Um, but I really think my internal team, what I have here, right, is, is the main partner, I would say. So my co-founders, Boss and Sabi, and then again, all the, the management layer, which, I, which we've built. Um, I don't have that much external um, advisors. I have a few, uh, for example, one of the co-founders of, of Mendix, nice word. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a company sold to Siemens, 660 million, and they got a billion investment afterwards. Really cool. Um, but I, I, I only talk to them whenever we really need it. It's not like on a monthly basis or something. No. I do always encourage our own management to, to get coaching if they can. So we also pay for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I still haven't really... Yeah, found a really great coach or something. No. Yeah. And if, if you talk to, to, let's say, one of your mentors then or somebody yeah. that inspires you, what, what are normally the topics uh, that, that you are asking advice or maybe just a, just a mirroring on? Yeah. Is, it, is it about the business or is it about scaling the team or is it about investments or is it very broad? Or? The, all of the above. No, it's, uh, 
it's it's uh, it's sometimes about uh, maybe uh, disagreements in the team, right? It's about how do you manage that. Sometimes it's about okay, um, the, we're looking for a senior uh, VP sales, right? So can you give me some tips where not where where, where what to look for or what not to look for? Uh, sometimes it's about strategy. Uh, sometimes it's about so we have an internal ambition to do an IPO in 2025 uh, for a billion. Um, so how are we going to achieve that? So the, all of, yeah, it, it's very differentiated, but I really try to uh, have one topic. So whatever bothers me at that time yeah. is the topic. Because if I, if I put another topic, let's say product, product uh, let's say product vision, and I'm not busy, I'm not doing that at the time, then it becomes a useless meeting. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Hey, um, last, uh, last question, which is related to um, what during startup bootcamp we call pre-mediation. Yeah. Uh, which, which is, an, I think, a super important topic, which is related to keeping the founders aligned uh, on, you know, their business goals, communication together, but maybe also how you are dealing with work-life balance, private situations. Yeah. I know that um, you did this during Startup Bootcamp, and I know also that you continue to do this after the program, uh, the three of you. Can you explain a little bit? what the concept of the pre-mediation is and how you've been doing it yourself without the guidance of a mediator or a pre-mediator? Yeah. Uh, so pre-mediation for us is basically, yeah, it's mediation before it's necessary. So it basically also became part of our no bullshit culture to tell what bothers us, right? So me, boss and Sabi, we go out for a dinner uh, once per month, not, not right now. So last time we did it at Sabi's home was also nice, um, but once a month, and then we really tell what frustrates us, right? So we try to prepare a little bit in front. Um, one talks, the others two listen, that's what we do. Um, so for example, I talk, and I would think we're for about Sabi, saying, hey Sabi, uh, this, this, and this, bothered me. And then we try to get out, of, get rid of the frustration. Um, because there are many things, if you work really intensely together, that secretly frustrate you. Um, and if you don't take time to talk about that, they, the small things will get really annoying and they'll get like this. And sometimes that you get an yeah, explosion of, well, well that's not necessary. Yeah. So, uh, that's how we use it uh, currently. And, and, and you don't use any third party at this moment to guide you there. You're, you're basically um, smart enough to do this together and you, get, you feel secure enough to, to address every topic, although it might be very personal, right? Because I think that's the issue, is that in the heat of the, the business, you, forget, you, you get frustrated and you forget really to talk about it. And you say, ah, I don't want to get I'll into talk it. about it next time. Right, we do it next week. And then you, you say, ah, oh, no, not a good moment. It's never a good moment, right? Yeah. To really address these serious topics. Yeah. Um, but you have fixed momentums during the year that you, that you basically sit down together and openly discuss them. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's super important. Um, and I think... If even look now we are with the three founders right we yeah. used to be like the only real management but now it becomes a it becomes bigger because now i have a um, seven or eight people senior management team right um yeah yeah so yeah. yeah i try to do, you it, do with it with them as well because the trust obviously between the three founders is very strong because you yeah. go back so but if you just brought me on board you know six months ago and suddenly i have to have a pre-mediation session with you I'm, I'm probably thinking something is wrong if rob wants to talk to me right so how do you deal with that then? Do you, do you take this broader now? Yeah, we, we, we are thinking about it. We did this in the past in, the, in the, when we were a little bit smaller. So with also different managers. Yeah. And we didn't do it for a while already. So what we do is with the management, we go and buy, uh, we go two times per year, we go on a trip, right? To everybody. And then we talk about these kind of things. Yeah, yeah. okay. It's also a totally different situation. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. For example, we, we went to Sevilla or uh, yeah. something like that, have some nice food, a few drinks on the yeah. bar or whatever that, that usually. No, I, I agree. You shouldn't have these conversations at the office because no. then it's business, right? And, and this is more, you know, in a relaxed environment where people are able to open up a bit more. Yeah. And uh, Rob, do you have two more minutes for some questions from the, uh, from the audience? Yeah. Because yeah. I'm getting quite a few questions in there. Um, there's a question related to uh, how do you buy balance the hiring versus outsourcing? Do you outsource? Do you, for example, your tech, uh, or is everything in-house? Core tech, never, I would never outsource it. Um, look, you're a tech company, don't outsource your tech. I know it's hard to find developers, but I would never outsource it. Some things which are very um, repeatable or where there's really specialized, specialized experience, 
uh, let's say just an example, a Magento plugin. Magento is an e-commerce platform. Yeah, yeah. It's a plugin to connect with SendCloud. Yeah. And we don't have any Magento developers. Right. Not that it's the case, but then we would outsource that. Yeah. And we would have strict specifications how things would work. So I would, things you can reproduce, yeah. like you can outsource, but for the rest, please hire. And uh, same goes with the recruiter, right? You can pay a recruiter a 25% fee on somebody's annual salary. But then if you hire four people through that recruiter, you could have had your own recruiter right. who actually yeah. hires four people per month instead yeah. of yeah. Uh, per year and, resolve, and, and saves you a lot of time as well on the entire process. Correct. Does SendCloud also hire non-AU candidates? Yeah, we have a knowledge migrant uh, thing. We, we already did that when we were 20, 20 people. Yeah. Okay, so you and you, you basically help them to sign up for all the, the knowledge migrant uh, yeah. application so, forms that are, uh, that are needed. Yeah, so we arrange everything with the IND, also housing, right? There's a package for that, so we help them move. So we have quite some experts. I think we have 32, 33 different nationalities in our company currently. So wow, nice. okay. Yeah. And if you, if you hire for sales, is there, is, do the salespeople always have incentive structure on top? And do you really believe in having incentive structure and why? So we I, have, I do have sometimes people that say people run anyhow, they work hard enough. You know, I'm, I actually don't feel happy if you would give me an incentive because I would actually feel that it is sort of like uh, an insolvent uh, that I'm not, you know, that I would run harder if I would get an incentive. How do you, yeah. how do you look at that? So we didn't do it until we were, uh, I think, 60, 70 people. Uh, we said we had the same way what you're saying right now, right? Like, ah, these people work hard enough for us. They don't need an incentive. Yeah. Uh, we, but then you're still very tight with your team, right? So yeah. if, you're, if you're a good leader or something, people really like to work for you. At yeah. least that's my, that's my, uh, that's my experience. So then, then they do it for you because you're good. But if you want to build a scalable sales machine and you want to have the best salespeople, they only will be here if you have commissions, if you have good salaries. Look, right. they can also go to Salesforce or they can also go to, what is it, HubSpot or Zendesk. Uh, they make 100k so you need at least we do that right now right we have a very good base salary structure and very nice incentives so yeah i, I would recommend it if you want to build a sales machine right um if you're small if you're 20 20 30 people yeah you can do it but i mean it's not necessary at least what i experienced yeah and do you also incentivize maybe the more senior team or even the junior team with, uh, with option schemes? Do you have like an ASOP, an employee stock option plan or? Yeah, we did that until I think 50, until we were 50 people, everybody got a stock, uh, everybody got stocks, uh, stock, stock appreciation rights, a SAR. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that was good. But then and yet like we saw in the Netherlands that people don't really appreciate it. Maybe now they do, right? Because the company, grew tenfold since then and they're like yeah. oh man it could be worth something yeah but yeah. back then it was like yeah i'd rather have more salary right um so um yeah depends I, a bit on the stage of the company and what your ambitions are right if you yeah. want to do ipo then it might be very interesting to have some stock you know at least some yeah. uh yeah, an option scheme uh, yeah. yeah but if you of course are 20 people right yeah. at least we didn't think about an ipo back then no. we would just thought Oh, let's get to the next round or let's try to grow the company. It's nice. Um, at least so, um, so we, uh, yeah. So, but I would recommend to give the leaders, of course, uh, stocks, right? So we still do that. So if you reach a head of position uh, or a team lead position, you get, you get a share package here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Last topic then on the IPO. Um, you mentioned 2025, we want to do IPO. Yeah. Why is that? Is that a goal by itself? Is that just something that you always dreamt of? Uh, when you were uh, 12 or how, how do you, uh, what, what is, what is the drive behind that? Uh, to be honest, right. It's, uh, it's because it's really cool to start something from scratch and an IPO is basically the, the most ideal scenario. If you start a company from scratch, you build it until it's a thousand people, it's an IPO and then it's an independent company. If you go for an exit, wait, look, then yeah, the, who we're going to exit to, maybe we're going to exit to, uh, to some, some lame company, right? And all the people who are here and built the stuff, they wouldn't be happy. So I'd rather build a really strong independent company. And that's cool, right? And maybe when we do the IPO, I'll be there for a year, maybe two. Maybe I won't. I don't know, right? Maybe I won't be the CEO. But at least we made a company that made it to IPO, which is really cool. 
but the goal would not be, I mean, mo many companies IPO because they want to raise so much money so they can start acquiring yeah. additional companies, right? And scale up internationally further. Is yeah. that also part of the vision to yeah. eventually go do M&A? Yeah, but that's already, that, yeah. That's already the case now, but yeah. 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 That's, but, uh, that's already the case now, which we were, we were going to do. But I mean, with, uh, with an IPO, of course, you're going to, if you, if you have stocks which are valued, right? Let's say you're a billion euro company, you're on the stock exchange, everybody knows what, what your worth is. So if then you can say, hey, I want to buy co competitor X, um, yeah, that, that makes it really, makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, let's talk again then. Let's not wait until 2025. We'll talk yeah. for sure earlier than that. I know that you, it's quite dynamic times and, and the company is doing well and you're growing quite rapidly, uh, uh, riding also the wave of e-commerce. So I think that yeah. the choice that you made back in 2012, not to continue with your own on online store, but to move into this domain was very smart. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely proud to see that you guys as co-founders have been able to build the three of you, were, which were in those days relatively young, right? In your early 20s. Uh, I know you're, you're much older now, but those were the days that we started working together. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's now a really serious company and one of the, uh, I would say, one of the diamonds in the rough for the next few years in Europe and probably beyond. So uh, thanks for sharing all your experiences. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, you can always reach out to me if there's anything that you uh, want to brainstorm on shortly <laughs> and uh, say hello to your, uh, to your buddies, to Sabi and, uh, and Rob, and we'll be in touch soon. But thanks for sharing. Thanks. Hey, bye. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hey. Great. Yo, bye-bye.